stepping over the line that even Mary Whitehouse would experience, we join the alternative, Fab Four. Picture this in a studio somewhere far, far away. MTV, bam, 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 a thousand images each video, but I do not have a three-second concentration span, and I can prove it. When I was 14, this young couple moved into the flats whose garden my bedroom window overlooked, and the wife was a PE teacher. And I can still remember when my mum told about it to this day. Young couple have just moved into the new flats at the bottom. Have they, mother, and what, pray, is the nature of their employment, mother? Well, she's a PE teacher. I suppose that's why she does the gardening in a tennis skirt. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I was like that for three and a half hours with neither my concentration nor my hard-on wavering. <laughs> Absolutely still a garden gnome with fishing rod. For three and a half hours, I didn't even blink. My eyes were covered in dust, filth and fluff like two boiled sweets in an old man's raincoat. <laughs> for three and a half hours with just one thought in my head. When's she going to come outside? <laughs> All TV seems to be MTV now. Like, is it just me, or has anyone else noticed that Michael Burke has started winking at the end of the nine o'clock news? <laughs> so it's like, and that was the news on the day that 400,000 innocent people are known to have died. <laughs> Honestly, I'll be going like this next. <laughs> we don't have a three-second concentration span, except when someone is giving us directions. And then, suddenly, we're like a strobe-lit goldfish looking at a housing benefit form. <laughs> well, you take the first left here. First left here. And then carry on to the end of the road. To the end of the road. And then after that, you stop following me anyway, so I might as well say anything I like. Uh, your mother is a whore. Mother is a whore. Your bike is a piece of shit. Piece of shit. Uh, you slag, you pont, you slag again. Slag, pont, slag again. Uh, bibble, nibble, bibble, bobble, tweed. I am the original traitor, Lord Whore Whore. <laughs> and then take the second right by the big safeways. Big safeways. Thanks. <coughs> Only luck or an angel's grace saves us from three-second conditioning. I may be the last reader of War and Peace. Because we're not used to concentrating for that long and there's lots of characters and hard to remember, you know, how they were first introduced. But that's the great thing about Tolstoy. Surface details aren't important, it's about souls. And there's this one character, Rostov, that I really relate to. And again, when I read it, I can't remember, you know, how we first met him or what he looks like exactly. But when I read it, I just think, I am Rostov. And it's exciting because I'm only halfway through and, like, this is the next bit now. At that point... Countess Elena turned to see Rostov bounding confidently into the room. My darling, she cried, kissing the top of his head and running her hands down the length of his back. <laughs> Rostov wagged his tail. <laughs> oh, God, have you been eating your own poo again, cried the Countess, wrapping <laughs> him a firm blow across the snout. <laughs> My mind is so full of garbage that the only time I can concentrate is when I'm doing something really trivial, like trying to throw a ball of paper across the room into the dustbin. And if I can't do it, after a while it'll become really important to me, so that eventually, to make it happen, to try and force the universe to comply, I always make some really drastic future event dependent on the paper going into the dustbin. It's like, right, if I don't get the paper in the dustbin this go, my mother's going to die. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Sorry, Mum. I wonder if big decisions were made like this. Lee Harvey, will you quit chucking stuff into the trash? OK. Right. If I don't get it in this time, I'm assassinating the president. <laughs> oh. Well, you don't specify what's going to happen. It's just something terrible is going to happen. Rubbish, I know. 
There's been a terrible nuclear explosion at a power plant in Brittany. Scientists are blaming David Baddiel. <laughs> he knew he wasn't very good at basketball, but he still had to go and put everybody's lives at risk for the sake of feeling good about himself for 10 seconds. Thousands of people all over Europe have already contracted leukemia. People so fascinated by murder. <laughs> because they are. They just love a good murder. <laughs> and it's the only crime that has that ring to it. Murder. It just isn't the same to have large scale fraud. <laughs> the Orient Express. <laughs> Some murderers eat their victims. In Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus, the main character gets his own children served up to him in a pie. Police are questioning Captain Birdseye. <laughs> Hello. Well, on this week's edition of MasterChef, we've seen Margaret from Docking. She chose to start with a salmon terrine, followed by chicken stuffed with pistachios and finishing with a fruit confit. Mr. Barbecue from High Wickham has cooked us a piece of chicken. I think this could just do with another couple of minutes. And finally, Dr. Hannibal Lecter shares a rather nouvelle menu, starting with human ears garnished with fresh chervil, followed by baked census taker's liver with father beans and a nice Chianti, and finishing with kneecaps in custard. Well, we've deliberated and cogitated, and the judges had a difficult time. But as ever, there had to be a winner. And this week, the winner is Margaret from Dorking. I don't think so, Mr. Grossman. <laughs> uh, of course, the more right on among you will think, oh, yeah, but what about war? Because that's like institutionalised murder, right? Yeah, fair enough. And there's all those magazines about how to kill people in war in combat magazine. War Monthly. You've seen the adverts. So, when do they extend this to civilian murder? Get part one of Mutilation and Maiming. The only magazine for anyone interested in dismemberment. <laughs> week by week, it builds into a complete guide to psychotic slaughter. In part one, we ask, dum dum or cross-cut bullets? Which cause the largest exit wounds? <laughs> In The Killer's Killer, we talk to Pol Pot about mass graves and how to hide them. <laughs> and with part one, our special strangling supplement, complete with a free length of piano wire. <laughs> so get Mutilation and Maiming. It's at your newsagents now. And if it isn't, kill the bastard. Whenever I see one of those commercials, I think, well, who buys these war magazines? Obviously, people do. Maybe that's the way to sell magazines. In the new Radio Times, Desmond Lynham on his favourite anti-tank weaponry. <laughs> Gloria Honeyford chats about how to incinerate your enemy alive, plus knit your own anti-radiation suit. <laughs> and try Miriam Stoppard's fun quiz. Are you a crazy apeshit killing machine? <laughs> it's all in the new Radio Times. <laughs> If you have someone you want to get rid of, but you don't want to do it yourself, what you can do is just hire someone to do the job for you. Uh, coming, number 12. Uh, coming, number 12. Proceed to 34 Thompson Street, uh, meeting a Mr Norris, that's Norris, and shooting him. <laughs> OK. Hey, Ian, I've got a job for you. Yeah, Mr Giles Smith, picking up from 12 Leamington Villas and dropping off into the river round the back of Safeways. <laughs> Yeah, good. Right, Martin. Martin, oh, thank goodness I caught you. Have you garroted Mrs. Taylor yet? <laughs> Only Mr. Taylor phoned to say he changed his mind. Yeah, could you just maim her for life? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. No, well, if you've completed the job, I'll just tell him we have to charge him the full rate, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> now, who's available for a Miss Sue Cook and a Mr. Nick Ross? <laughs> On TV, murder is always complex and tangled with a firm motive. But the post-war murder has increasingly become random, meaningless, motiveless. Murder has lost all its subtlety. One of you was responsible for the murder of Monsieur Hutchinson. And it is now for Poirot to reveal the truth. 
Monsieur Hutchinson's body was discovered brutally assaulted with bits of him all over the kitchen. Mes amis, this is the case unique. For the first time, I must confess that Poirot is completely stumped. But I have sifted the facts, and it is obvious that the murderer is Madame Passworthy. You vicious bastard. Thanks. Uh, I suffer from a strain of Tourette syndrome, which is the disease that makes you shout and swear uncontrollably. And uh, it also makes me blurt out rude and offensive things I don't realise I'm saying. It all started during my troubled adolescence. Hello, Auntie Janet. Crikey, with a moustache like that, you should be in the circus. <laughs> I know, something that makes the Tourette's and all of us worse is when people you don't know very well start being really kind to you. I mean, do you ever get this urge? Here you are, love. Any friend of Robert's is always welcome in this house. Piss off! <laughs> Sorry. We all owe so much to Jean-Louis Tourette, the man who gave his name to Tourette Syndrome, and yet we only have one extant picture of this man who spent his whole career surrounded by people swearing and spitting at him. <laughs> When Truly Madly Deeply was on the other week, I, I noticed that although the whole film is set in London, there's a group of mentally disturbed people in it, and all those bits were actually shot in Swindon, using a group of mentally disturbed people from Swindon. <laughs> and you can understand why they did that, because, you know, London's a bit strapped for nutters, isn't it? <laughs> Don't you just find that? You're walking through Leicester Square, you think, I'll tell you what this place could do with. 350 more people going, Oh, I'm the head of Tesco! <laughs> I actually met the director of Truly Madly Deeply, Anthony Minghella, and I asked him why he hadn't just, you know, shot the whole film in London. He said, I couldn't find any nothing! <laughs> I mean, care in the community. That was based on a lot of research, wasn't it? Yes, well, if the public demonstrate the kind of spirit we know they can, I think we can confidently expect to see the mentally ill ignored, mugged, and then shortly afterwards tricked into sexual intercourse. In short, everything they're used to in a mental home. <laughs> With all this going on in the streets, people get very them and us about madness. You can't even trust your friends, you know, so for some people, they're only sanctuaries in going to see an analyst. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, viewing these feelings you describe in some sort of overall pattern and thinking about what you've told me about your sense of personal identity as a whole, I would say that the root of your problem is that you are mental. <laughs> you mental! tablets. Hello, is that the funny form? It's all right, I've found him. <laughs> it's never them and us. Like, I have my own personal madnesses. Like, for example, I get particularly appalled by the way that your pubic hair peeps out on either side of your briefs in a sort of pant... <laughs> in a sort of pant moustache. <laughs> and when I thought of the phrase pant moustache, it sort of snagged in my head, right? For ages I was going around thinking, oh, pant moustache, pant moustache. <laughs> It got so bad that I was watching TV and a news flash came up and it went ITN and I just thought pant moustache. And it's Super Chelsea, Super Chelsea FC, they're by far the greatest team. The only things Ray's voice could say genuinely were just those things that anyone else would say sarcastically. Hey everyone, I'll tell you who I think the best team in London are, Tottenham. <laughs> this was a difficult time for Ray, as it was also round about now that I had my one lapse of concentration with him. It was, I remember, after one of our sarcastic things said genuinely sessions. I don't know why Andrew wouldn't want to be married to someone who looks like Mick Hucknall. <laughs> Excellent, Ray. Good, good. Oh, yeah, that's a real breakthrough, that is. <laughs> oh, am I cured? What a fantastic psychiatrist you are. Well, you ungrateful little shit. <laughs> oh. Ray, 
condition got worse, he missed a few sessions, and then I'd found he'd had yet another near-fatal accident when he slipped on some soap on the 19th floor of an office building. Fascinatingly, Ray's condition had now got so bad that he was unable to even fall out of a window sincerely. Yikes! Whoa! No! What a personal result! <laughs> The British have got a unique attitude to animals. For a start, we have this fear that the moment we cross the Channel into mainland Europe, any animal we see will probably have rabies. <laughs> and the trouble is, the residents of Boulogne have sussed this out. When they spot a British tourist, their idea of a laugh is to give the cat a bowl of Persil washing up liquid. <laughs> Let it wander around the local hypermarket. No. Of the animal kingdom, I prefer to go for fish. Fish have been important in history, they're mentioned a lot in the Bible. One of Jesus' greatest miracles was the feeding of 5,000 people using five loaves and two fishes. What was he cooking? Now, who doesn't like cod in breadcrumbs? <laughs> then there was the story of Jonah, who got swallowed by a whale and had to spend three days trapped inside its intestines. Got out, went home, cancelled his subscription to Greenpeace. <laughs> the British also think that keeping animals locked up in a zoo is immoral. But look at the way some animals behave when they're left to their own devices in the wild. Look at the ostrich. What a stupid bird. <laughs> now, when an ostrich gets frightened, it buries its head in the sand. <laughs> So there it is, right? The ostrich, wandering around the barren outback of central Australia. Suddenly, in the distance, it spies an approaching dingo. Oh, no. <laughs> Here's a dingo. <laughs> Never mind, I'm one of the world's fastest land mammals. <laughs> I could leg it. <laughs> no, I'll bury my head in the sand. <laughs> Never noticed me down there. What does it think it's doing? For a start, suppose when it gets frightened, the surface that it's standing on isn't sand. Suppose it's standing on concrete. <laughs> gets a bit frightened, nuts itself to death. <laughs> and why is the ostrich so stupid as to think that these predators are only interested in its head, like not its rump or its legs or any of the other nice tasty bits? No other animals are that stupid. Cows don't march into the abattoir going, keep your heads covered, lads, you'll be all right. <laughs> And also, if its head is buried in sand, how is it supposed to know when the danger is gone? I've been down here ages, haven't I? I reckon that dingo will have gone by now. Oh, shit! <laughs> also, surely this technique can't work even for every ostrich. I'm claustrophobic! <laughs> I'll tell you another thing about the ostrich. It runs in a really stupid way. Like it hasn't worked out how to use its knees yet. <laughs> I mean, look at it. It might be a beautiful and majestic creature, but it moves like Michael Barrymore. <laughs> People are always telling me to get a pension scheme. A pension scheme, yeah. Thanks. Can I have the nose pimple with hair coming out of it and the colostomy bag as well now? <laughs> A pension scheme doesn't actually mature. You don't get any money out of it until you're about 80. Yeah, I really need £100,000 to spend on yellowing pants. <laughs> no, but honestly, I'm, I'm really looking forward to old age. I'm particularly looking forward to collapsing from hypothermia in safe ways because I'm concealing a frozen chicken under my hat. <laughs> Jesus, you get to a certain age, about 14, and all you can hear is the shovel hitting the soil. <laughs> yeah. One minute you're just standing there thinking, well, at least I've still got my looks. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I've lost many things, but I've found that at the end of the road, one has one's thoughts and one's memories and the dignity of wisdom. Bing. I'm the head of Tesco's! <laughs> we here lay to rest the body of Robert Newman. Good evening. Once again, I'm joined by Professor F.J. Lewis, Emeritus Professor of History at All Saints College, Oxford. I understand that some viewers felt that last week we rather skated over the topic of Great Britain 1931-38, the austerity years. I can only offer my apologies and pledge that Professor Lewis and myself shall make every endeavour to fully explore tonight's topic of discussion, the 1905 Sebastopol Uprising. 
Professor Lewis, do you feel, as many do, that Sebastopol was indeed the birthplace of the Russian Revolution? See people who talk like this. <laughs> That's you, that is. That's you talking your best. I see. You see girls running like this. That's you, that is. That's how you run. See your bike. It's a girl's bike. I do not own a bicycle. You do. And it's a girl's bike. Well, I'd just it's like to... It's for girls. You see those workmen's tents in the road? I have observed them. That's your house. That's where you go on holiday. You see this? This is my drink. You can't have none. Mm, yum, yum. Tasty. Oh, I've just remembered. Sorry, I'm busy drinking my drink. Your dad phoned me up the other day. My father? What did he say? If we might return to the matter in hand. Yes. I have here a copy of your book, Origins of the Crimean War. Poo! Uh, poo! It smells of poo! That's because it's been inside your mum's bra. <laughs> well, it would appear... <laughs> So very smelly. It would appear that the Sebastopol question is one that will continue to cause heated debate between historians. <laughs> Professor Lewis, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
because it's so tempting, isn't it? Sometimes I think the fluid inside the womb must have been baked beans. But I always used to hate alphabetti spaghetti. Is the British educational system really in such a bad way that we need the help of this bizarre pressure group? Literacy through pasta. <laughs> Plus, the manufacturers took a terrible risk. Right, Martin, what letters can you see? F, U, C... Right, stir it all round, stir it all round. <laughs> I mean, if it was such a good idea, why didn't they try it with other subjects? Why didn't we get algebroni macaroni? <laughs> Little shapes of X's and Y's and equal signs, or geographini fettuccine. <laughs> Ribbons of pasta in the shape of the world's longest rivers. No, alphabetic spaghetti is downright harmful. When you spot someone on a train, unable to start a book until they've smothered it in tomato sauce, you know it's claimed another victim. Or you're in a restaurant and you spot a dyslexic trying to read the soup. <laughs> Despite all this... <laughs> Despite all this, some adults just can't bear to admit that they've lost touch with youth. And in particular, there's a certain type of teacher who seems to suffer this. Hi, I'm your new history teacher, Mr. Jeffries. Call me Tim. <laughs> Who's on top of the pops last night? Yo! <laughs> now, I want to chill out with some history. I want to rap about the Renaissance. Now, think of the Renaissance like a rave. <laughs> Except instead of getting high on drugs, these people got high on the rebirth of classicism. <laughs> Sounds like a PM Dawn lyric, doesn't it? Yo! Any questions? <laughs> Sir, sir, when are you going to stop being so sad, sir? <laughs> Yo, good one. Uh, I tell you what, yesterday I bought the new Ride album. <laughs> it's got a good beat. <laughs> but in the end, all this nostalgia for childhood is a terrible thing. For example, it's amazing the number of adults who get ludicrously attached to the teddy bear that they had as a child. It's, it's completely irrational, sort of symbolic, I suppose. It's just extraordinary. Hugh, for example, has had this since he was three. It's Teddy. <laughs> Look, it's not Teddy, all right? It's just a bit of old nylon stuffed with some cap on. It's Teddy. <laughs> It's just tragic, really, isn't it? And the extraordinary thing is... The extraordinary thing is that for years you forget it's even there. You stick it up in the loft for two decades and you just forget all about it. And then one bored Sunday afternoon you go up there to look for something else entirely and you find it completely by accident and immediately... It's Teddy! <laughs> just sad. I'm sorry I left you upstairs in the cold and the dog. I didn't mean to. It was a mistake. Look, you've got to leave this part of your life behind, all right? No, look, come on, come on, look, you've got to snap out of this, okay? Just, just give him to me. Give him to me. I'll put him up here, right, and he can watch the rest of the show. You get the good fun, view. Right? Just put him here. See there we go, you see? You. Maybe later we can have a tea party <laughs> with proper cups. <laughs> it's steady! <laughs>